Good afternoon. So wonderful to be back with you, talking about issues for business that need attention and careful peeling of all the elements that are critical to the running of businesses. My name is Ashutosh Sena, and I'm your host. I will be your host for the next 90 minutes to talk about something very interesting. Today, the topic is Retail Next, the future of CX or customer experience. And what better topic to talk about in a world which is driven digitally more so in the last 18 months. We just don't tire of speaking of that 18 months. And the reason is very clear. The world has turned upside down. This kind of a situation has created opportunities for businesses. So I will try and raise some of those issues that the digitally savvy customers are making brands and that, you know, all what these customers are making brands and retail companies do as they transform in the post-pandemic world. While I raise the issues, there is a stellar set of people who will share their points of view and their decades of experience on the topic. But first, let me give you a big picture, a broad picture for it. Here's what it looks like. India is going through a retail revolution like never before. The promise of organized retail market showing explosive growth of the next decade has kept small and large brands busy as they try and reach out to their consumers. Busy, did I say that? Well, hyper busy would have been a better term to use. And why not? Because of the sheer size of the opportunity. With the rapid expansion of digital channels, brands now have a greater opportunity to take their message to the consumer, something and sometimes directly as well. On other occasions, one of the major challenges brands face is delivering an only channel approach to the consumer. For retail companies, that is critical. They want to be seen with the customer trying to influence his buying decision at every stage. Of the way. Only channel, that is the magic word for the customer experience today. As CX evolves, retail companies are employing methods to keep customers informed and also influence his buying behavior. So, how can retail companies drive that only channel approach in the post pandemic, digitally driven world, getting consumers? used to a better experience can help brands win them as they embark on their digital journey. And you know, quite a few of these companies are putting together their digital strategies or have been at least putting together their digital strategy as you know, the world was hit by pandemic and we all came out of that. How can the consumer journey be made better with digital interventions that he can relate to? So it is about taking the big picture view that comes what. As I said, some of those leading names are joining us to talk about the issues. So let me introduce all those who are joining us today. The first, Vivette De Cruz, Senior Director, Retail and Consumer Products Practice at EY, joins us. Thanks so much, Vivette, for joining us. Amarnath Roy, Senior Vice President and Head of Omnichannel, Metro Cash and Carry India. Anurudh Banerjee, Chief Sales Officer at Spencer's Retail. Adarsh Nair also joins us from Airtel and uh, among other roles that he has, his CEO of Airtel Digital. Anand Naran, Vice President Marketing and Consumer Experience, Bata India. Katie Prasad, Managing Director and RVP India and Sark at Zendesk. And Aman Thakral, Business Head at Target Integration. Thank you so much everyone for joining us and uh, you know, taking out the time to speak about something so important today uh, because this is so important as businesses evolve and put together and execute their digital strategy. So here's, let me first give you a sense of what we'll be talking about over the next 90 minutes. First, of course, uh, we will have the introduction and we'll uh, request Katie, Prata, uh, Katie Prasad to give his introductory remarks. And of course, later we dive into the discussion, we ask questions, we try and make it freewheeling so that everything that you want to hear 
from the experts. They can take up those issues. Ashutosh, you are probably on mute. Okay, so let me let me just mention that uh, again. So here's what the way we'll try and go about it. So we'll try and get everyone to well in interact with each other, each other as much as possible. And I'll try and come up with some of those questions in between so that you get to hear the experts and you have an, uh, an exciting 90 minutes and a very enriching 90 minutes as well. But uh, let me first ask Prasad for his opening remarks and also so that we can, after that, we can dive into our discussion. Prasad, it's over to you. Thank you, Ashu. Uh, thank you, ET, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, if you're okay, I would wanted to quickly share a small deck that I could run through um, as a context. Okay, host is disabled. I don't have rights, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and like Ashu talked about, um, year 2020, 2021 changed everything. Uh, it has brought in some businesses uh, to, to the knees and it brought some businesses to the skies. And it, it changed the consumer behavior. So especially in the context of retail, I think you are seeing a hockey stick growth across, uh, especially in the e-commerce particularly, and then retail industry actually, you know, as a, as a, as a back end of that, it came in. But in this industry, if you look at it, uh, or even outside, there's one thing that basically constantly evolving is your customer expectations. Can you believe 75% of customers think about your CX before making a purchase? I want you to go back and reflect upon you being a consumer, what are you seeing when you're trying to do a business? Is it a product? Is it a service? Or maybe a customer experience that you had with a different brand or that brand? 50% of those customers will leave if they have just one bad experience. That means if you are running a business, it's important how important the CX is for your business because you could lose a customer just with one bad experience. Now, add it all, I think overall your company's success today and in the future really depends on how your customer service is and customer experience is. Now, having said this, I want to take a pause and take back and, and ask you a couple of questions. Now, there are two things that have changed. Number one, you know, you've seen businesses are differentiating themselves or competing themselves on experiences, not by product and services, because those are available across everywhere. If I get a better experience in this particular brand that I work, so I will do more business that become more loyal. Now, what that really calls, I think I call that as officially arriving of experience economy. We are all living in experience economy. And that experience economy, the, the currency is the customer experience. And, and better you have it, the richer you are if you're a business. But at the same time, look at the customer. And the customer has evolved in the last 18 months like Ashutosh talked about it. Now, those customers earlier who used to start from a physical journey, digital journey, you know, we talk about combination of physical, but I think we have officially arrived in a, you know, you know what I call a customer journey mapping, which is called digital first, virtual every day. If I'm segmenting a customer today, my customer, irrespective of the business that I operate, my customer might start their journey with digital as a first option. They might look at some information online on a website or computer website or accessible across the globe. And then probably they will make a visit to you in offline retail or maybe make a purchase on digital journey itself. But digital has become the primary first step towards the journey and your customers are embarking on the journey. So it's very important. And in this journey, I think if you want to deal with the customers today, I think what we have seen working with several hundreds of thousands of customers across the globe, we have seen the emergence of what we call messaging. So customers today, you want to live an experience economy and I call language that we speak is what we call messaging. You want to make sure you as a business want to engage your customers the way they engage their friends and family in a very messaging formula. That means if I'm talking to, for instance, Amar today, Maybe I would have gone back to my WhatsApp and I've seen, I would have interacted with Amar four months ago, maybe visited him on his birthday, maybe an anniversary, da, da, da. You know, historically, I can take a look at every interaction that I had with the customer. You know, if I'm a business, I could see it all out. And so as the customer expectations. 
customer wants you to realize that you know they've interacted with you four other times and this is the common thing that they talk so they want you to have a historical conversation that they had with you so that way the emergence of messaging is there and i call that is a currency to live and thrive in customer experience and i think that sets the tone on how future of cx would be that all will be live and thrive but you know i i gave from what a what a thing but i'm keen to learn from the expert panel sitting on today and also to participate uh, thank you et again ashutosh over to you okay so prasad you always make me think uh, you're talking of customer and the history of interactions so that history can help me scale geography if i may put it that way and Absolutely. move across move across uh, different areas as well so i have this habit of you know getting to the headline part but let's start with the questions and you know it's very interesting that we're talking today because look at the kinds of companies that we're talking today and bata almost 100 years in india spencers well well over 100 years in india and we also getting some input from target integration from some of the others from zendesk and the other companies so it's a very interesting discussion that will happen so let's start with the experience of the oldest companies first let's get to bata we we all used the product i guess at some stage of our growing up years 90 year old brand that has well over 1000 retail stores in the country ananaran how's the team at bata making as a proverb goes the elephant dance so that you can address the pulse of the customer yeah thank you ashu a uh, very interesting uh, analogy you actually put us uh, so we like to call ourselves as uh, 126 years young so globally bata was started uh, in 1894 Uh, so we prefer you know to be seen as slightly more younger you know or contemporary uh, the omnichannel journey you know for us has been very very interesting i think covid was uh, one of the shockers uh, stores shut down all across the world uh, consumers were stuck at home uh, nobody was actually buying formal shoes and you know, what the brand was actually known for or even school shoes uh, at it was uh, already known uh but before actually covid hit uh, the omni channel journey at bata had already started uh, so you know uh, bata being present in about 70 markets uh, uh, we could see this journey evolving in uh, italy uh, in indonesia uh, parts of latin america so we could see that you know there is a shift there and when i talk about omni channel uh, it's not just looking at only the customer experience side it's also looking at the availability of the product how do i actually ensure that the product that a consumer walked in to actually buy can be delivered to their homes even from another store or even from a warehouse so i think it, to that extent to the transparency so let's say if i am actually searching for a product how it can actually uh, be made aware a consumer can be made aware about you know where it is uh, lying mm-hmm. to simple things like you know driving sales and traffic and integrating digital that one so you know you searched you started your journey as prasad was saying you started your journey here you were researching online you land up into a store is there a history that i can actually capture that yes consumer was searching for a casual shoe or a sneaker and when he lands when he or she lands up in a store the staff is actually made aware that the consumer was looking for a running shoe so i think it's it's that kind of bland granularity of information that we actually look at when we are creating an omni channel experience the last leg i would actually say is you know you know basically segmenting consumers because if you look at omni channel consumer it's not one consumer it could be our you know mom and dads you know who might be in 70s so they are like digital uh, novices you know very difficult for them to actually start uh, using credit cards because they just don't understand it. they are more like a cash economy to somebody who is a digital adopter people in their 30s and 40s uh, very comfortable across there and then you have the digital native you know people who are born in the internet era you know they actually open up and there was wifi all around you know <laughs> so that's like the the gen z i would actually call so i think you need to tailor the customer experiences for each one of them uh, right from discovery to deliveries to you know how they purchase what is the level of human versus a bot so i think that's what we are actually doing at bata you know looking at segmenting the consumers and creating a distinct uh, you know experiences for them So, hundred years uh, in India, almost hundred years, and even longer globally for Bata. But Spencers is even more older. How difficult is it, uh, Anuradha, for you to make uh, the elephant that you manage dance according to the way you want? 
Hi, hi, Ashutosh. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so though it's a uh, hundred years, but in New Avatar, it's uh, around twenty-one years uh, yeah. from, uh, from the time it is with going cards. Um, but last, uh, the six quarters are, are like you know probably sixty years of transition that we are uh, seeing. The same say, set of customer, same catchment, got fragmented, got fragmented into general trade, got fragmented into new age retailer, the big retailer, big box retailer, the digital retailer, and a few, few of the local guys, local new entrepreneur who also started the uh, digital form of it. So, so it's, it's all about uh, getting the agility. Uh, in, in the food and grocery. And being in food and grocery, we are not shut for a single day. So we are a part of the essential community. So, so our transition of understanding the CX, expectation, adaptability, agility started from uh, day one. So, so what was the out-of-store model, uh, which was around, let's say, you know, 2 to 3% is now more than 25% in a six-quarter time. So, so what does it mean? It's not only consumer change, our business model got changed. The employee base of 5,000, they were hired and trained with some skill sets. Now, uh, you know, they are into a different skill set. So how we have trained uh, the entire employee base to get into that space to adopt the new CX uh, experience. Mm -hmm. I'll talk more about a uh, particular experience and uh, how, how consumers are expecting. In, in a brief sentence, I will just give one a live example. Probably in uh, two years back, the destination was a non-food category for me within the store. Uh, then it, it got into fish within the non-food segment. Then now during uh, pandemic, it became Hilsa, a destination category within that segment. Post wave two, it became Bangladeshi Hilsa. And today, the CX expectation is boneless Bangladeshi Hilsa. So that kind of expectation consumer has gone through and we have managed through a new concept of relationship manager, which normally you have into white goods, you know, service industries. Now for our oil, basic, you know, rice or other commodities, we have a relationship manager. So we have multiple channels to service it. Apart from the digital, we are in you know, chatbots. We have a traditional 100-year-old uh, channel in India, which is a phone delivery. Now, modern trails are adopted, and we are the pioneer in doing it. So a large double digit of sale is coming through a phone delivery model. Mm -hmm. Just to conclude it in the phone delivery, when the customer is ordering, one order also came last week, say, it's in a snacks category. The customer wrote Papa Wala brand. So, so that's the ultimate uh, statement of customer relationship and CS expectation from from uh, from retailers. Yeah. Okay. That's that sounds very interesting. Okay. So when we to, when I try and speak to the other brands which are also part and you, you'll be hearing about today, let me try and get Vivet in and get get a sense from her. Vivet. When you look at the cons consumer and retail companies with their strategies, their CX strategies, what are some of those points that stand out from the pre-pandemic times to now? How has the state of preparedness for some of them changed over these 18 years, uh, 18 months and um, probably looking better as well? Yeah, thanks, Ashu. Um, I think there has been a big fundamental shift that we have seen in these past 18, 20, uh, 20 months. Uh, you know, I've been working with retail companies in categories like apparel, grocery, even jewelry, right, who are pushing very strongly for this entire omni-channel uh, journey of theirs, right from the time of defining their strategy to the time of implementation. And I think as Anand also mentioned, and I heard one of the panelists say, some of these companies who have done this correctly are seeing sales as much as 30 to 35% coming through this omni-channel business of them, right? So they are seeing a fundamental shift in the ways of selling. 
uh, let me explain through a story right one of the brands that we were working with a very large sports retailer uh, you know and po- pushed by covid stores shut down they decided to embark on this entire omni channel so as any typical retailer they got listed on marketplace they set up their own store uh in the stores they try to do uh you know uh, digital checkouts and digital cataloging and everything but no matter what was happening the sales were still stuck at a sub 6% so when we got in uh, to understand what the brand was going through uh, we realized that the customers felt that their online and offline experience was completely different so while offline was very engaging online suddenly became like as if i was going to a completely new brand to buy right and therefore we realized that brands now are focusing a lot of time which anand mentioned anurudh mentioned in really getting the customer segmentation right right who is that customer what is the experience that they want and then having all the building blocks put together and brands are struggling a bit but i think they are getting it now that in terms let me set the foundation right with the customer and And then put my building blocks of supply chain, analytics, uh, uh, you know, organization structure, KPIs in place, so as to ensure that it's a sustainable model. Okay. So just to remind everyone watching, there are quite a few people around who are uh, with us online. Make sure that you put in your questions because some of the experts would love to take them. And of course, uh, leave everyone wiser with their experience, their collective experience. Okay, let's move on to the next question. And you know, Vivek, you just make me remember some comment I heard from someone. Of course, I didn't verify it with the uh, the company. This is Titan, almost doing hundred crores a month in online sales. One hundred crores or so. In well, I wish I had uh, confirmed it so that I could say it with more confidence that uh, this number officially they have confirmed, but I didn't get it uh, confirmed. Anyway. Let's move on to the next question, Amarnath. If if companies are looking to start with, and you know, at some stage you have rudimentary CX experiences and CX strategies, but if they were looking to do that omni-channel approach, where should that beginning happen? Yeah. Nice question, Asu. I think. Uh, so you know where most of the retailers actually struggle the struggle is between you know you want to move very fast very agile you want to adopt what is happening around you want to change but if you look at the indian landscape ashu i think most of the retailers have been in the ecosystem for quite some time now 10 15 20 30 and maybe 100 years also right the worst part is i think in this years of existence we didn't look at our legacy system you know how to change it yeah how to make it you know a more robust system a better tech stack that can be used for personalization yeah we never thought about engagement with the customers off store on store outside yeah on app etc and in last 5 years what it has changed as well is all organizations have started thinking about how to give customer a better experience of on store or maybe uh, extension of the store through app now if you look at the customer journey per se asu uh, it has got three stages primarily to define one is your discovery then is your you know purchase when you discover something you tend to purchase and then you engage yeah for a retailer if you ask me all three of this gets into one single funnel and any disruption at any point in time in any of this will actually lead to a dissonance now if i have to tell you where to start i think the best part to evaluate it is you need to have a seamless you know a, a cross integration offline online you need to have a seamless data flow right you, the app or the system that you are creating should have an ability to you know roll out the dynamic content and experience for the customers right your tech stack that you are building in should suit or maybe the tech stack in in simplest form i can tell you should be able to personalize it i'll explain some of this uh, so uh, sure. see when i when i talk about you know a uh, cross channel integration 
I think most of us, most of the retailers, what we did, we never build our own IT systems. We kind of used it for plug and play. Yeah, because we wanted to be like, you know, quickly boarding the bus. We didn't want to miss the bus on say whole digitization process. Now, what are the implications of it? The implication is pretty clear. So beyond a point, you will not be able to customize the plug and play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, so for, for example, I can give you about Metro is, we, we, we are not the IT companies. Also. We, we, we had to do it. We, it was for us, it was like, you know, well-crafted, careful crafted strategy where we thought, Let's just do it. And the approach that we took was like, you know, crawl, walk and run. Yeah. We didn't want it to start running by just doing the commerce. And as Vivek mentioned, what we did is we chose our customer segment whom to target with first. And as you know, I mean, I mean, most of the panelists and the viewers, if they don't know, we are a B2B organization okay. we are governed by the government FDI guidelines, not opening to anyone and everyone. So here we took our Kirana customers, which is like, you know, a large portfolio for Metro, the bread and butter. We kind of build our strategies around Kirana hotel, restaurant caterers. We took Kirana as one primary segment. So when we started working on it pre-pandemic, we were just on time. When we launched something in January, 2020, one month of beta testing and we had to rush towards getting it launched pan India. So what we did, Ashu, is first, first things first, as I said, crawl, walk, and run. We ensured that the customer has got a very seamless discovery and purchase phase. Yeah. And then there, so then we prioritized things, and that was on the move, Ashu. So we mm -hmm. had we had 15, 20, 30 things that we had to prioritize basis our business business requirement. Then what we did, we prioritized, deprioritized based on the customer feedback as we interacted. And one of these things was also during the pandemic, supplies were completely disrupted. Yeah. And as a B2B retailer, we were always dependent on say manufacturers to streamline the whole supply. And the implications was that, you know, post billing, you always had some amount which was supposed to be refunded. While the refund process was pretty seamless, going back into the source account and so on. But looking at our entire banking system and infrastructure, it used to take three to five working days for us. One of the functionalities that we built and was in our plan was wallet, you know, so that Metro has its own wallet, the customer transactions becomes very seamless. We had to prioritize it. Yeah, so it was supposed to come in 2022, we prioritize it. And we prioritize it because we didn't want it to block the working capital of Kirana who were already struggling. So this is like, you know, again, you trying to personalize that experience of the Kirana. Now they can look at the money in the wallet. Now, the other thing that came us as an idea from looking after customers, you know, feedback, et cetera, is why can't that wallet be used in our offline stores? We mm -hmm. thought of one use case, Asu, that, you know, this is something to streamline the whole, uh, you know, refund return process. But now we have a use case that, you know, customer wants to use it offline as well as online. So on the three legs, if you look at, so discovery is there. Now the purchase is in, in, uh, enabled. Now on the engagement part, uh, so this is very critical. And as, as I said, the data are lying in different systems, different corners. Yeah. Now, any, any, you take it any retailer, yeah, be it Walmart, be it us, be it anyone, our legacy systems are our biggest barriers and you need to iron it out. So if the data is lying in different corners, uh, so it becomes extremely, extremely difficult to engage with your customers because you would be putting up, pulling out one data very important point, very important point. Let and me then, go to Adarsh on that because, yeah. uh, you know, that is a very interesting part and it's very important because Adarsh, the sheer size of the number of customers that you handle, give me your experience of one, the data part that uh, Amarnath was mentioning about and also how about, how did you go about hemming that omni-channel approach with that scale of of uh, the number of customers? You know, as I was hearing everybody speak, I could connect uh, to a lot of you. And I connected most to Amar, right? Because uh, Edel got a bit lucky. Uh, it was not a month before, but in 2018, we took an initiative to upgrade our customer experience. So we had a good year, year and a half worth of runway. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of context before I answer the question. Sure. We divided our customer experience strategy into five pillars. 
and it's the same you know keywords that are coming up again omni channel digital first we are a unique one war on failures third pillar the open telco somebody talked about transparency we want to be transparent to our community, uh, to our customers mm-hmm. and finally purpose uh which was a mission to just remember that we still had a lot of frontline agents helping our customers so just keeping them in mind and saying everybody else is working for them mm-hmm. including me we're all working for the frontline right so these five pillars defined our strategy back in 2018 and you know it's funny we were talking about numbers roughly in a month the telco does about a little about 5000 crores of revenue in a month across our lobbies right today 3000 crores of that flows through online that is staggering number 60% 2018 we probably half half of that in terms of online representation so a lot changed during the pandemic but it was a build up that we had some time to go do and take care of so i'll answer the omni channel question first so what's happening inside the telco today we have distribution now as a platform so every time the customer touches us so they could touch us inside one of our 400 stores they could touch us uh, in one of our million kirana points where we sell our sims it could be on our app and web or it could be even in our contact centers any time they touch us it's all connected to one system so this is your omni channel kind of view point and we built it in parts and pieces right we got one channel done then we went to the second then we went to the third all the data is now centralized in one dmp a data management platform these two resources of tying the channels back to one centralized data is what's powering our omni channel version and we are still taking baby steps by no means are we complete but today if you walk into the store talk about an order go back into our app you will see that order carry over and then when you call our call center you can very quickly quickly switch into that order that you had just started you can finish it in the call center so this is actually running today painstakingly done over the last many many years right i'll give you one more example of how we had to innovate during the pandemic so we were we were thinking digital anyway but the pandemic did uh, make us change we were roughly at about 40% online recharges at the beginning of the pandemic and as many of you called out here our customers were at loss those who were recharging offline they could not even walk into a particular recharge center to recharge because neither did they know how to do it online so this was a real problem so we launched something called the superhero where we incentivized any human being who could help their friend recharge they would actually get a 4% cut at the recharge everything done through our app believe it or not 30% of our recharges went through the superhero during the pandemic and our total recharge strength went at one point of time to 80% it's kind of fallen back to 60 all this was our journey during the during the pandemic and today it's it's just the continuation of that the world has changed everybody is online i'm looking for the day when 80 90% of our business is entirely online so let me pause there more than happy to go into details sure so let me ask amon then so amon how do brands decide retailers decide how should the intervention happen and at what stage of its you know of its existence of its business should the invention uh, should the intervention happen thanks ashu for uh, having me here see very interestingly uh, the choice of automation does not really have a particular timeline it's not that you complete 10 years of your journey go for automation complete your 15 years of journey go for automation it varies from uh, company to company if you look at it it's just like a human life everybody has their own journey now as an organization probably you start in 1800s or start in 1700s but if you have a vision where you want to go to you will surely reach to in certain time uh i know everybody is talking about pandemic how pandemic changed the game but if you really ask me i think the change, game got changed way before than that it's just that we realized it only when we been you know kept in the uh, cages of our own house it is actually the way you look at it if you look at the numbers done by a lot of uh, e-commerce platforms or if you look at the numbers done by a lot of uh, food delivery platforms you will realize that the numbers were ever growing even before the pandemics Right. it's just that the pandemic came up and it became a catalyst to make everybody feel that listen there's no other way but this way so uh like how others said it is 
that you have to make sure that the journey, the category of your customer is getting served well or not. Now, yes, like uh, Mr. Anand from Bada was saying, there are categories of customer. You have customers who are in the early uh, age, who are born in the Wi-Fi world, they have internet access, and you have people who need support. Now, very interestingly, uh, telecommunication has changed. If you look at the period where we had two major players, then became three, the data as availability became super easy. Earlier data used to be very expensive and now data is very easy. You would see nowadays uh, a very common phrase used in our household called WhatsApp University has a lot of contribution of people who are not really going and working, but sitting at home. Mm-hmm. No, we all have our family WhatsApp groups and you would see the first good morning message does not come from a young guy, but comes from a guy who's actually in their 40s, 50s, I, I won't say 40s, but yeah, 50s, 60s. Now look at the way technology has been adopted. Look at the way people are changing. And yeah, pandemic, you can blame it. It is what is had grown. But I, from my point of view, we've been saying this past 13 years that this day will surely come. It just came a little early because of pandemic, but yes, it is. Now, going back to your point, how uh, businesses decide, that's completely up to the business. Do they want to have the journey done quicker? Do they want to, you know, uh, put down their whole overheads a little lower, have more automated systems, have the history tracked? Conventionally, you would realize that why the moms and pop stores, the corner stores always worked because you knew that local person. This local person can give you credit. This local person can know what, what is happening in your life. This local person can tell you that you usually eat these, these things in the evening. Now, if we do not track this history, and like Katie said, it's all about the data. Data is the newest currency. We are, yes, looking for crypto. We are, yes, looking for everything. But data is the real currency. And if you have that data correctly managed uh, or you have intentions to correctly manage it, you can start this journey as soon as you launch the company or probably up to 200 years. Okay. Okay. So just to, since we're talking number of years for the company, I was just reminded that Airtel completed 25 years last year. Yes. So, so I got a thumbs up from others. So I'm pretty much uh, spot on with the age of the company. Let's move on and uh, talk, ask Prasad. Prasad, you mentioned about the experience economy. Does that customer... You know, does that drive everything? So how does that kind of a thought of keeping the customer at the center of it all translate through other parts of the businesses? You know, I, I think keeping the customer at the center is a, is a core pillar. And I'm so good to hear everybody talking about how important the experience, you know, I've heard uh, others talking about digital journey starting sometime, you know, before or even Amar talking about, I think everybody mentioned about that. I think. But if you look at, I think traditional businesses uh, across the world are two, in two industries, banking, financial services. Second is also retail. There are two ones which are pillars of the business. Mm-hmm. Tech, um, no offense, Telco is 35 years, you know, Airtel, Bharati is in India, but also before. But I think one thing which we see, uh, I'll take example of a solid example of banking industry, which is probably slightly outside of the purview, but you just understand how putting customer in the center is important. You might have, you know, a personal relationship, wealth management, insurance, uh, and maybe four or five other product. They could all be treated as an individual customers rather than one, because you defined a business process around how you want to deal with customers rather than putting in the customer. Oh, if I have a customer, the customer would need a personal, uh, you know. Uh, you know, personal banking and also would need a credit card. So the centering around the shift has happened in India, I think, and across the globe of putting customer in the center in the last about five to 10 years prominently. But in the last 18 months, if you're not putting customer in the center of the business, I think most of the businesses have went out for, uh, you know, they went out of the business. Very simple. Um, and, and, and also, we would talk about defining customer segment. But I think I will take that one level above and say, you got to define what the customer experience journey is. First, define the journey that you want to do, your customers to have with you, and then start putting anything. Sometimes customer experience journey mapping means not about putting a technology. Technology is one of the choice that you will have to solve in the journey, but not the only option. But if you think about customer experience and the journey, 
then the rest of things can follow through and your business will stay for a long period of time because this customer expectations are changing and changing very rapidly but because you mapped all the journeys it is far more easier to move around imagine you know uh, you know other ways around where the world was where you centered around businesses where you can't move around and those businesses who are kept business in the center or customer all either been disrupted or been dismantled which is into smaller pieces so that they can all focus on the customer okay so the thought has to begin at the top the change probably has to begin at the top so vivet when you speak to companies how does the board or maybe at the top level at the cxo or the ceo level how does how has their thought changed that is driving and how is it showing up when you speak to companies so um, if i had to say ashu i think the first fundamental change that we have seen is that when i used to go about maybe 4 5 years or even maybe in one two years ago you know cxo ceos used to say oh this is how my stores are doing this is how my online is doing uh, this is how my third party is doing but they when they when you actually go uh, and what i think a lot of the panel members have said is that they are changing their view right they are saying that i want to become for example with one of these apparel companies we define their objective as i want to become the stylist for my consumer now how is it that i can change myself to meet that requirement of the consumer so that is what we are seeing an entire approach rather than a channel how i am selling how i train the people it's more about saying this is my consumer this is what he or she wants how do i service it that's one thing and the second i think fundamental change which has happened uh, is the entire reorganization of this uh, you know internal structure right uh, it was completely fragmented earlier right uh, somebody going to a store or you have store operations somebody buying online you have an online operations today it is again to say this is the customer this is what he or she is buying for me how do i create that seamless experience not only externally when they log on to my website or to a mintra or to going to my store but internally how do i align myself so that they are not lost in the cracks and there is one consistent team servicing them so these are two three things which teams are changing and i think the fundamental change which every again everybody spoke about is the data right uh, companies struggle on data um, you know because it's coming from so many sources so i think a lot of companies today if they know or they have to identify what to change uh, i think they're taking a pause and seeing where that data is getting insights from that data because you know i think one uh, approach that i follow with companies is that do not ask customers what they want they do not know you have to observe them you have to see what the data is throwing to you you use that and then you build your entire approach to them right uh, so that's something that companies are really focusing on in terms of getting the data corrected or data consolidated in one place and then defining how to approach so i think these are the three changes that i'm seeing in terms of discussions that i have uh, with the ceo cxo levels uh, in organizations so i can sure 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 I can build on these two points that Kitty and Vivek said, right? Because I completely agree. One one point on the customer journeys, and the second one uh, more closer to what Vivek was talking about. So on customer journeys, if you take a look at Airtel, just take our three businesses on the consumer side. We have a live TV business, broadband, and we had mobility. Three separate businesses. For the longest time, we built them as three separate businesses. Mm -hmm. And when we bought our digital journey in, it was almost five years ago. If you look at our app. you try to pay for your dth service you will get a particular journey the minute you try paying paying for mobility you will get a completely different journey why because it was built by two different teams on the same app now our customers brilliant point that vivet said observe what the customers are saying you would see user behavior on these two journeys very different mm. one journey is more efficient in conversion the other one is failing and you talk to customers you understand because there's no consistency you know airtel is approaching that in one place you got a red button in the other place you got a green button So now they're thinking, well, I should not click red because that's that's not that's danger. But at the same time, the business thought, oh, red is Airtel's color, so let's put OK and red. But then you have OK and red consistent. You didn't another place. You have OK and green. All this had to be sorted by observing the customer. And today, if you come on the app, when you're paying for something, it's a singular journey. You add things to cart and you check out and you pay. 
And that's the journey we've been kind of painstakingly doing for three years, only because we observed the customer and we realized that they were not able to enjoy all these different varied journeys. They wanted consistency. The second point I want to build, and these are just very interesting insights about India. So when we showed our payment page, just talking about data, we saw that we had an enormously bad payment success rate. Somebody's trying to pay, they're not succeeding. Now we thought it was a technology problem. Somebody mentioned it's not always about technology, right? We thought it was a technology problem. See, the fun insight we had is when we looked at the data, we found out that a lot of customers were going to net banking instead of UPI, instead of credit cards. So now the team concluded net banking is the most popular way of paying. Therefore, there are problems with it. Then we call the customer. And then he said, customer, looks like net banking is your favorite payment schema. Guess what the customer said? They're like, sorry, what, what's net banking? <laughs> and they're like, you know, in this, in this path where you see this net banking thingy, oh, Amara wala bank. Bank ka logo samaj mein aage, mein click kar de. I clicked the logo I understood. And we sitting over here, luckily we had the data to tell us this is a section that's failing. But we had the fortitude to call the customer. They told us that they liked the logo, so they clicked it. This is the extent to which the Indian customer does not understand digital. So data plus just being with the customer, observing them, as Vivet said, really allows you to build the best journeys. And then you increase your success rates. So just to okay. score. Okay, Amarnath has a point. I mean, it's fun to hear all these stories. I'm sure you have some of those as well, Amarnath. Yes, Asu. So I think um, I'll, I'll first tell you about you know our journey. And we have been like fortunate that we had Arvind as the CEO who drove this agenda top down. And he's like, you know, five years, six years back, he was very clear that Metro needs to operate the, the way the other organizations in the industry operate. Coming on to the customer experience now, think of a customer, Asu, and for him, a grocery retail is like, a, you know, buying uh, soap, shampoo, et cetera, on a monthly basis, doesn't have a lot more, you know, any fun when you're going to buy, right? Coming to the store and what is his routine if you look at inside the road or, or maybe what is his journey inside the store? He goes, picks up a you know basket, moves around, picks up, walks out. Now this has been so monotonous as a journey. Yeah, without any engagement, without any personalization, you're just looking at the self, you're looking at the price, putting it inside the basket, you liked it, disliked it, it's a black hole for a retailer. Why did the customer didn't turn up next month, though he had been like, you know, coming here every month, no one knew. And if you have to really convince those customers to come inside the store on this say monthly, fortnightly, whatever you think of is a frequency at your store, you need to have a proper engagement at your store, right? When I say engagement, so most of this, again, harping on how these tech systems have been like, you know, obsolete. You don't know if you have to personalize an, a customer experience in your store. You compare it with, say, online experience, right? So Asu bought X brand of toothbrush. He's been buying, replacing it every three months. So you have a recommendation that Asu, you buy Colgate toothpaste now, right? Can you do that recommendation in the offline world? And if you're not doing it, you're technically obsolete. On the payments, building on to what uh, you know, uh, uh, others said, same problem happened with us. We somehow realized, you know, everyone is looking at a net banking and, you know, uh, making a payment through net banking and realized that, you know, the customer technically connects with that bank logo and then says, oh, this is the payment option because ours, ours is a Kirana set, right? You don't expect a Kirana to look at, you know, the UPI and look at the customer right. journey, the flow. So, so you, so as a retailer and as others said, I, I think we need to connect with the customer to understand what is he looking at? What is he trying to look at? Yeah. And then offline and online, his journey should be like, you know, more or less in the same funnel so that it's a brand recall. It's a recall of his journey on both the platforms and it becomes a seamless to him. Okay. So let's go across to Anand as well. Yeah, Anand, uh, you wanted to make a point uh, here. Uh, I was just trying to build on, you know, what others said and Vivek said. I think so. One of the questions that you actually asked is how important is CX, you know, for the CXO committee or even for the board? And in case of Bata, you know, uh, we went through slightly through a, uh, a very uh, evolved phase. Uh, stores shut down, as I actually mentioned, and then we actually launched uh, the website. Used to exist, uh, and you know it would contribute about three four percent, you know, uh, pre-COVID. 
But as you know, we went through this COVID transition, uh, we had to actually uh, really you know, change the way we actually offer omnichannel experience. So we scaled up our presence on omnichannel, uh, you know, uh, the marketplaces uh, like an Amazon and Flipkart to uh, you know, relaunching our website, which is all more connected on a world-class platform uh, to even actually looking at you know, what is the backend service. It means, do I actually have a ticketing service to actually look at the customer who came into my store and had a problem? And is it one ticket I'm actually able to look at it or is it like different Excel sheets? You know? And if I'm actually committing to a store customer that I can actually refund you in X number of days, can I actually also do the same for an online customer? So I think these journeys needed to be actually uh, stitched together uh, across multiple functional teams. So it's not just one team that actually looks at uh, you know, the customer as such. It's like marketing doesn't own a brand. The brand is actually built by every touch point in an organization, right from a store manager to the guy who's actually installing, let's say, an Airtel dish uh, you know, to somebody who is actually even speaking to you as a CXO you know, across there. So similarly, the customer experience doesn't actually get delivered you know, just by a campaign or just by a store manager, but even to the guy who's actually sitting in a finance team or a warehouse assistant who's packing the right product. Let's say you know, in case of Bata, if I'm actually, if you order like you know, sneaker in blue color, and if I delivered you a black shoe, how quickly I'm actually able to get that product picked up, return, and actually replace it with the right product that you actually have. We worked on all these consumer journeys, looked at you know, the breakage points cross-functionally. And then in the last 18 months, we've actually grown from really 5% contribution of uh, the digital revenue to 15%. So it's almost like a 3x journey for us uh, you know, from that perspective. But even looking at you know, the services uh, like channels, uh, you know, somebody actually asked a question. Do you actually look at one channel, which is like a website? Or do you look at a store or can you actually create some hybrid new channels? So like conversational commerce, we launched like a WhatsApp shopping uh, during the transition phase. And we saw that there was a big uptick across there. We use consumers, you know, as a point for collaboration. You know, people would actually call a Bata store and actually say that, okay, what are my loyalty points? But we said, okay, it's now available on your WhatsApp. You just send a WhatsApp, it figures out what is your mobile number, and then you can actually have the experience yourself, you know? Uh, so, so that's what we see that, okay, you know, the future for us, uh, you know, if you look at Omnichannel, is giving more customization or personalization to the consumer. Uh, it's also about conversation. It's not one way, you know, the previous world. Uh, it's also a lot more about collaboration. Uh, like in our case, you know, uh, one of the fundamental things in a shoe industry, footwear industry, is what is your size? And because consumers were stuck at home, we actually said, okay, I'm going to give you a scan your foot, feet, and you can actually figure out the shoe size. So the, the, the app would actually, you know, uh, the web app would actually tell you, you know, what is your shoe size. And, you know, we saw Ashu that because people were actually using that to actually place the order, it was right order, right size. And the number of returns actually reduced by six to 7%. You know, in an omnichannel retailer, the returns can actually kill a retailer. Uh, so we saw that, okay, that became like a good opportunity for us to actually offer a superior experience. Okay. Anirudh, Anand referred to some of the hybrid channels as well. For something which is as core as food retailing, food and grocery retailing, what are some of the opportunities that have emerged for you? And how have you built on your traditional understanding of the business? So, so I will uh, touch upon two things. You know, the first I will touch on the non-food and that will actually uh, stretch Anand's experience, uh, how it flows into non-food expenses. So we, we have, uh, uh, for a longer time, we have not been able to uh, open our non-food section. So our food sections are open for the shopper, but non-food section was uh, not allowed uh, from on-premise angle, but from a delivery angle, it was allowed. So quickly, we uh, uh, got into some system and we did a digital floor work for the shopper. So individually, all, all the customer service agent, they become the relationship manager. And we took the housewives, students, uh, digital floor work of options, sizes, and print. And we just got their sizes. And a sizable amount of apparel is sold just through phone calls. It's, a, it's a, an art of, and we never uh, thought that that can happen. So, so all the traditional challenges got broken 
into a fragmented market. So in April, the way we sold through the phone call, similarly, we in summer, we sold air conditioner, refrigerator. So through the same digital journey. Now coming back to food, you know, food we are doing for much uh, longer years. What, what we, we figured out that it's always, you know, uh, data-driven and uh, AI-driven calls, but at the flow level, they don't understand that much of data translation. We enable them if it is an online app-based program or if it is a phone call-based program. But when the footfalls are happening, for them, they are their memory become the digital card for the shoppers when the customer was interacting. So instead, because how we can give a seamless experience to the shoppers in a multi-channel format. So we become a solution-oriented company. And what we thought, I will give the kitchen solution to the housewife who is entering into her kitchen every morning and evening. And how I can solve her problem? Because every morning, be it your house, our house, you know, we figure out two or three things are missing in the kitchen. And we are only half an hour or 45 minutes from actually getting into the cooking session. So, so we took a positioning that, you know, you just call us and within some few minutes, you know, half an hour or one hour, I will supply that to you. And that solution become a recipe based solution. So from a product based transaction oriented retailer, so we went one is the channel which become a phone call channel or a app channel. Second, from a transaction at a product level, we become a recipe based uh, solution oriented company. It's the way I'm telling it, it never happened overnight. It took a couple of quarters. But actually, now we can see the frequency of the shoppers with us is double of the frequency of app or offline. Okay. Uh Amarnath, there are so, okay. I would also like to take some questions that are coming in. There are a few of them coming in. There's a question from Sita Raman here and that says, can CX stocks be totally distanced, distanced from retailers inventory because the quality of items he bought, offers he got, it's all that matters. Amarnath, your take. So, sorry, Asu, if you can repeat the question or may sure. I read? Sure. So, it says, can CX stocks be totally distanced from the retailer's inventory because of the quality of items he bought, the offers he got, or all that matter? Is it not? That's the question. Yeah, yeah, it's it. It, it is. Because, see, I, I tell you what, uh, Asu, I think one of the challenges of this whole Omni channel is managing your fulfillment, right? Yeah. Your, your order and fulfillment. So you, there is no dearth of order, let me tell you, for any retailer. If you open up multiple channels, order will just flow in if you have a good brand equity. The question here is, if you're keeping everything seamless, and as I'm assuming that you know your selection, price, availability as a hygiene, and then you are opening it up, right? The point here is inventory. Can you segregate it for the customer? At what point in time the retailer would know that you know this particular inventory I should not accept any more orders because there are no, so this is the same pool of inventory that you are opening up for the customer. So the recommendation here is if you are opening up an omni channel, you should definitely know your cutoff. Yeah. Your offline and online cutoff should be there. You should have a separate inventory pool so that you don't end up in a bad CXR. So you can receive orders, but then that will lead to dissonance if you are just refunding or returning on account of unavailability. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another um, uh, question from Vikas Jaiswal. It says, uh, Seamlex CX strategy to amplify business growth. That's the point he's trying to make. How to capture customers' changing behavior patterns to deliver enhanced CX at all times? Aman, can I toss this one to you? I knew this is coming to me. <laughs> right. See, uh, very interestingly, Ashu and the gentleman who has asked this question, gentleman or lady, uh, traditionally people consider sales is more like how well can you pitch the product. But if you look at the, the last uh, decade, you'll realize it's not only about how well you can pitch the product. That's great. That's your branding. But it's more about psychology. Whether you're selling online or offline, how well can you know the 
uh, the customer, the consumer, the way they react. Now, technology, and often this happens that people go ahead and talk about why technology worked or did not work is basically because of the reason that they only rely on technology. If you have good customer journey being intact, if you have an entire psychology of the customers being checked, checked whether they are clicking on bank because of the HDFC logo or any other logo, or they're actually doing it because they've never been taught, then only you can reach to that level where you can design these strategies. And that's where technology would come into picture for you to actually relate and answer why you should have this and why should not. Now, interestingly, uh, one of the conversations that we also saw that people said, uh, technology does not go in hand when people go offline. No, it does. It does, but you have to now involve the human intervention. Mm -hmm. Who's now? Because when you're on a website or a mobile app, a bot is speaking for you. You should expect, now a human should speak after seeing the same data when the person is there on offline. Mm -hmm. So yes, I changed my brush after three months. Would you like to have it again? Or do you, why are you not coming to my store? Because somebody has not called him and checked have you gone out of vacations? Are you okay? Are you hospitalized? So it's not only that you should interact to your customer whenever the you know uh, order is being required, but there has to be a constant, a consistent engagement, and that's where the technology would come into picture to guide you in that direction. Okay. Also, uh, also the so okay. Let's take one more question, and uh, let me. Ask Vivet if you'd like to take this. Uh, Ashish Sharma makes a point. Says that to my experience in the last 15 years of organized offline retail in India, digital transformation is like changing the wheels of a running car. What areas need to be prioritized to make it work with least disruption? Vivet, uh, is there a fair comment always to make because Things are evolving and it will always be a running car. Yes, Ashwa, I think it will always be a running car. No matter what you do, there will have to be some disruption, right? Uh, so what we suggest or how, how we embark it, and I think I've been saying this from the start, is that, you know, fundamental building block is my customer, right? So when we worked with one of these grocery chains who were looking to launch an entire new customer program for both their online and offline, right? Mm -hmm. So where we spent time, we got to understand the customer and then we actually did a pilot test so that, you know, the existing customers, you know, they were managed well, there was no big disruption. IT is a big change that has to happen, you know, what will come in and no matter how much we observe, uh, it's only when you implement, you will start to learn, right? And that gives you feelers of how to do. So I always tell clients that if you're looking to drive this journey, there are two things First thing that you have to prioritize, please get a clear understanding of what you are solving from your customer perspective. Secondly, if you do not want to disrupt your entire setup, pick up key areas and launch it there, test it fully, and then sort of get into a, you know, a larger scale launch up. So there has to be a prioritization either in terms of you know, an area that you want to pick up or in terms of a brand that you want to do. But other than prioritization, it will only lead to you know, a big sort of, uh, I would say more of a dissonance to the customer. So you know, pick a little slow, but prioritize with the customer as the starting point. Okay. Uh, sure. can, I just, um, can I just add? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So I think just building on Vivek, I think it's a lovely question. I think you don't need to actually stop and literally, you know, change the car tires and then, you know, actually start again. You know, the advantage of working in a retail environment is that you have like probably hundreds of thousands of uh, stores. You can actually do a pilot proof of concept, uh, you know, let's say 10, 15, 20 stores, probably in different regions, and then see some of these learnings across there. Let's assume, and you know, as Vivek also mentioned, start with one audience. You know, as we segmented them into three, we looked at probably one audience and said, okay, for this audience, the journey actually has probably five, six steps. Let me do a pilot only for this step, which is, as an example, they don't want to step out during COVID times. Can I actually offer them shopping at their home, you know, on their phone? Is phone the preference or would they actually be called by a store manager? You know, as uh, uh, Anirudh was actually men mentioning in case of Spencer's. So I think look at these proof of concepts, look at pilots, and then you can actually scale it up if something works and, you know, work in a slightly agile manner. You know, you don't need to perfect the product because during this digitalization, 
uh, you know, during the last 18 months, consumers have become slightly more open. You know, they are more forgiving, uh, you know, in terms of experiences. They know that, okay, everybody's going through slightly through a phase and uh, they're more accommodating in terms of how they actually give feedback to the brand also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Avanath. So Asu, I think uh, uh, I concur with the view of Vivek and uh, Vivek and Anand. I think uh, it's a learning. Uh, from our side, I can share you what uh, uh, with you what and the panelists what happened to us. See, we wanted to do too many things before you know pre-pandemic. I'm telling you, the roadmap was pretty comprehensive, and then it looked like you know it will take three to five years to do it. But then we realized that if you want to deliver it all in one shot, it's technically a robust, humongous task with a lot of manpower, capital investment. And then uh, what we were not confident in, whether it will work, not work. And this is all five years back. Also. Now, one thing that came out as our learning is if you're planning something new for an organization, that should be in synergy with your existing business. So that, you know, the, the overall, the larger scheme of things, the, the you know, in organization starts looking at the benefit immediately after your rollout, right? If you have, you might have a very good, nice product roadmap, you want to do it, everything, but if it takes five years, I think retailers mostly lose, run out of the passions, right? The other important point also is here is your strategic ambition, yeah, and your aspirational customer exp uh, your experience should firm up your omni-channel strategy. Yeah. So where you want to be, for example, if I say that, you know, today I want to, and on our actual ambition is to be number one omni-channel player, B2B omni-channel player in the country. And then your customer, you know, aspirational experience that you want to be, that should marry up your overall strategy. And then you pick up, as Anand said, you want to do a pilot in say one city, one store, there are multiple permutation combinations that will keep coming. And then you can just, you know, pilot and scale it up. Okay. Okay, let me also I think uh, sure, Adarsh sure, sure, had something to add, I think. I think Adarsh was uh, raising that. Okay, I miss, I'm so sorry. Adarsh. Uh, no worries. Thanks, Katie. I was just referring to another question that's within the same vicinity. Mm -hmm. Sita Raman again asked, when Airtel says omnichannel, is it happening at the Kirana stores where the SIM is sold? Like customer details are known. Mm -hmm. You know, this goes back to some of the question uh, where I think it was Aman who mentioned offline also needs to have intelligence helping the customer. So this is in the same tune. So I just want to give you a sense of a story there. So when Airtel does offline, we develop using a, tech, a concept called human in the loop. And I think Aman referred to it as keeping the human interaction in mind. So every human in our frontline, installer, a person in a Kirana store, it could be a call center agent. They all today have what we call a one Airtel dashboard that they carry with them. It could be an app, it could be a website. It, surfaces to them customer intelligence mm. with enough privacy controls. So it's mm. not like they know everything about you, but all the information that is necessary for them to do the job is with them. For example, in the case of a retailer, the next best recommended action for the customer goes to them, to the retailer on their app. Mm -hmm. So when the, the person comes to recharge, they plug in their number. The minute they plug in the number, the dashboard is filled up with certain actions to be taken. Mm. And that is powered by AI on the back end the same technology that is powering the app and other channels. So therefore, even the Kirana Stopus, within the limited purview of what the person can do, is being powered by data, is being powered by customer intelligence, and then they're serving. So this concept of omni-channel truly goes offline, okay. powered by the same central systems that's powering the digital channels. So just a thought. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll take uh, Anand. Uh, Anand wants to make a point. Please. No, no. I just wanted to add there. You know, very nice point by others. Even we have something similar. You know, we call it customer single view. Uh, the store staff and the managers can actually give the best recommendation, the next recommendation when a consumer walks in. But I want to actually add here that it's a huge culture change. You know, you may actually have the best omni-channel strategy. If you don't invest on actually upgrading the frontline staff, their knowledge base, and how to treat the consumer, the interactions, I think it's not going to fly. So, so do invest in that last mile touch point uh, because they are your brand ambassador. Uh, they actually deliver the experience, and it's very important to actually get that right. You know, at the last mile and the last touch. That's where you know the coming to the the, the running car example. That's where the tire meets the road. You know, the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. 
So, Prasad, I have a question there because we are talking some bit of a little bit of privacy and how customers' data is exposed at their stages. For a lot of companies, when you get these emails from their teams, it says no reply at something.com.in or whatever. Okay, so this is customer experience. You are bombarded with SMS, you're bombarded with emails, bombarded is the word. Why does that not go as input for CX? It does, and I think you've touched upon a point that uh, I, I, I used to harp on it quite a bit to all the companies, tech companies. Uh, so all of us are here for one fundamental reason, because customer is important. And one of the greatest touch point is actually you reaching out to customer, hey, here is a great set of products that you should probably buy, or maybe you had a great experience working with us, or maybe you bought a purchase something. Here is a summary of my your order. And we say, don't reply to this email. Damn. Why would you want to kill an opportunity for customer to interact with you? That is a gold mine. You want customer to reach out to you in the most frictionless manner. You create an opportunity and you kill it for yourself. And I, I, I think even now I see those marketing emails and I'm telling you in, in whatever sense that I know that you, in, in fact, we, we get a lot of those customer emails or, or, or business emails, right? Where a business is standing to something. For me personally, those businesses who always encourage the customer conversation, listen, like even Vivit and others you know, talked about and observe, those are the businesses who are driving a better experience. If you try to send one-way communication, that's the reason and no offense. And probably with a, with a telecom you know, expert on the call, I'd say the SMSs in the world is dying because it is asynchronous. That means you send out, you don't even know whether the SMS has reached the customer. There is no way to verify and that's the reason I called in the beginning, the world is moving towards more of synchronous messaging, what I call is WhatsApp or a social messaging or like social messaging. You could still send a text within the context of customer and you should understand that, oh, I've sent this text to the customer and customer has responded. Now the same customer went onto social media because this customer said, you know, I've, I've asked for it, they've not responded. If they're not able to find that information, that leads to frustration. So. Uh, my only single recommendation, actually, when you have an opportunity to interact with customer, open your gates for hearing back from them. Yeah. Every touch point, you should listen from them rather than we should speak. And, and if I may ask, Prasad, uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, also, some customers don't want it. What about them? Absolutely. I think, you, I think the best thing that has happened, in my view, from a customer point of view, a GDPR that is launched a couple of years ago, right? It is given the power of, of who should the contact, why did the, how, should, how should they contact in the power of a consumer rather than on the business. And the consumer can sign up and say, you know what, hey, I don't want you to be contacting me on phone and I don't want you to contact you on probably on, on telephone, whatever that, that could be, and you should respect that. But I can tell you one thing with, again, a lot of heavy heart, how many times, go back and ask yourself, you get unsolicited calls selling you card, loans, and all the other stuff. You know, Everyone and, and more, you know, more important, Lashu, where I get frustrated, you get a call and there's a voice bot talking. I said, damn it, I call you, hello. <laughs> you don't even say hello to me. I mean, I would never, personally, never deal with such businesses who sent me automated voice calls. Sorry, uh, it was usually oh. earlier, it used to be done by one of the FinSo company. I used to block their numbers. Um, and, and I'm sure a lot of my friends also say, you know, I'm sure others is there, he's laughing. So it, is point there. it is definitely yeah. a business uh, issue there. Now, Vivek, so in the light of that, because we are soon going to get uh, India specific, uh, the IDPR as it's been called. So sometime we hope to have that in the near future. How does that change the way, you know, CX happens? Because some of that will come under the purview of the IDPR. If you can shed some light on that. So, um, Ashu, while I'm not an expert in the entire thing, but I think what brands, and you know, we've been working with some legal companies of some, uh, you know, consumer product companies especially, uh, I think they're still trying to understand the applicability and how it will evolve from an India perspective. Um, and I think they believe that this journey is going to take maybe another one to two years till it happens, right? Uh, but if you ask me readiness, uh, that is something which I think Indian companies are waiting for uh, a little bit more. I don't think they are 
fully started on that journey other than you know the larger telecom banks and all those things i think uh, retail uh, you know the this sort of sector is starting but i don't think it's as advanced right so i think they are waiting and playing a little bit of a watch game uh, seeing how this will evolve and then sort of decide you know what sort of data they can share uh, one thing which we also realize is that a lot of people take um, you know indian consumers a little bit for granted because very often we just keep on clicking because we just want to move on to the next screen so um, I, i you know a lot of people believe that when it does happen uh, everybody will say i accept i accept and will not really know what is happening right so that is something which i think a lot of education has to happen both from the consumer perspective as well as for the company perspective so i think there's a little bit of time that my uh, sort of view on this okay abana uh, we had the experience of uh, whatsapp you know i'm just using it as a as an example not getting into the details of that how the same okay to their terms and condition it created a little bit of an uproar so what does that mean for the future when you try and reach out even as a b2b business to some of those kiranas to you know restaurants or to other businesses so oh, that's a that's a challenge also for sure because uh, even so if you want to use the whatsapp business account right mm-hmm. i think what people don't understand ashu is uh the how how much of it is actually getting your privacy issues how what kind of impact it will have if you're saying just okay is it like you know you put under surveillance is it like you know your chat goes uncrypted and then it's visible to you know the the operator i think people and then because of this i think in our customer segment also so it so happens that if it is a negative trigger yeah then it's it becomes extremely extremely difficult for a customer to convince that i would be using whatsapp for marketing yeah and then the customer decides that not to open and not to say okay because if you have to use whatsapp as a business account you have to at least say first time okay to receive those sms uh, that you send on a business account and now people are so apprehensive about it so that you know they they said i, I just can't say okay many kar sakta i can't say okay to everything that you send right and we had to convince them this is like you know the promotional message because you the, the some of this thing contents that we want to send it to you can't be sent on messages you will not be able to open it up right but simply i am telling you it 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 complicates the life of a retailer because if it doesn't work the way the consumer customer thinks or the operator thinks it has to be made far more simplistic than what it actually went yeah and here in this particular case i'm telling you uh, it it it's a problem for us now you so you are limited with your communication channel right your email rates are opening rates of an email are pretty low yeah smss you don't know it's getting delivered if it is getting delivered did he read 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 in thread and then on top of it there was something which was perceived as being working in the channel because what's up penetration as sector as sector but then with this coming in i think it has made life bit complicated for us in terms of communicating with the customer adarsh as the as a pipe and i i mean i just want a broad picture from from a telco's point of view uh, the sheer reach that an airtel kind of a brand has and you know the other telcos also have what does this mean and how could that experience be enhanced if not actually if it doesn't fall can it be enhanced at all So I think there's two parts to your question, which is what does the telco uh, do Correct. structurally for everybody, sure. enhance the experience, and then how can we help a business enhance the experience? I think there are two questions there. Okay. Let me try to take both. See, as as people were talking about um, spam and and things like that, there are things the telco can do, which is, for example, every SMS that flows through our network, we could check it. we could actually have a whitelist we could actually go block hence you have concepts like dnd right um on the other side there are businesses that who are actually buying these sms and then they are sending it through our pipes right so there's a bit of a a conflict of interest in terms of like which way do we support do we support the businesses or do we support the consumers some businesses treat consumers well others don't so i think the right solution goes back to what was mentioned earlier telco should actually develop spam filters and give it in the hands of consumers yeah now this is something we're thinking about deeply 
and we want to kind of bring it out, let's say in the telco app. So there you can actually start analyzing your messages and say, I don't want these messages and we can block it. There are things like that we should be doing. So I would, I would agree, you know, as a consumer, I get hit with that robo dial. I get hit with that SMS. And I'm thinking every day, how do you structurally change? The challenges being there is on the other side of business who's buying these assets from us. So putting the power back in the hands of the consumer is the right thing to do. And as a telco structurally, how do we enable it? The data law will make some of this happen naturally. Mm-hmm. For example, today, I don't know if you realize, for the first time in my life too, I'm going to use the word blockchain in a manner that it's going to work. SMS is actually blockchain for all telcos in India, which means every business that is sending these SMSs is on record. So we have that much ready. Now the question is, if it's a business that's abusing, then what do you do with that? That policy is not clear. Once government makes that policy clear, the telcos can enable, no problem. So there is the structural thing that telcos can do. Now, let me come back to what can we do to make things better, right? For businesses and for consumers. We've developed a homegrown technology called Airtel IQ. It's nothing but a SaaS digital layer that is sitting on top of the telco. What does it enable businesses to do and how will consumers benefit? One of the features the technology has is the business can put their name on that call that's outbound. So let's say you actually ordered from Swiggy and Swiggy calls you, you'll show up as Swiggy. So now you've context and you'll pick up. You're like, yeah, that's not a a bogus call. And and more and more businesses, as they start putting their name on, you at least know what calls coming towards, whether you want to pick it up or not. Going back to a little bit of that personalization. Sure. Second thing is trackability. When you send something out, let's enable you to trace it. And this is why you see this SMS spam. Take a million people and spam all of them. Hopefully 10 of them want it. How about making SMS traceable? And this could be done with a simple thing such as a link or some backend tracing coming back to the business so that they can be more targeted. So these are things that IQ enables, which allows businesses to use the telecom resources better. And hopefully that also helps to the larger question you're asking. Okay. So there's a very interesting- I could raise this, Toshu. I could raise this one thing. I I really liked what uh, others talked about. Put the power in the hands of customer. And that's such a- it's a, such a refreshing to hear that, right? If customer has a choice today to, to get spammed, absolutely. But at the same time, businesses also need to look at it. Let's say, you know, I think we talked about market and customer segmentation. Cus- businesses should smartly look at the data. Okay, we did a robotic call into this, maybe KT Prasad 20 times in this last two days, but hardly there is a, you know, they don't like it. In fact, they kind of go back into social media and comment about why you're spamming me. And that that could be a segmentation. Maybe I'm not a digitally savvy born and a consumer for them, maybe by my age, maybe I'm an adopter, but I behave like differently in digital world, right? I think understanding understanding consumer behavior and putting in the center, I think others, what you just explained, man, is so resonating. Give the power to the customer, let the customer decide what they want and what they don't want. I think that will address the prior, you know, piracy as a overall, sorry, privacy as overall for a, a, a big time. Okay. Uh, okay. This is an interesting question from Rishi Vijay Raj. And I'll just sum up the question for Aman there. He says, how is digital world going to manage that humane touch? It's something very important for business as well. See, uh, interestingly, businesses can manage the human touch only if you read the data. Right. It, the data is the key. Uh, how you set up technology, what technology you set up, what's the background, which software, all this is secondary. The Every aspect happens in the digital world is to capture a data. You look at Facebook, you look at Google, everybody's capturing data. The behavior or the purpose is not, prob- I mean, of course, I'm going towards the good content. The purpose is to know the behavior and psychology of the customer. Now, if you understand this, if you understand, like Katie said, that I am calling him 20 times, he's not answering my call, understand he's a different category of customer. There's a category of customer who will answer your call after seven o'clock. There's a category of customer who will not. There's a category of customer who opens their uh, Facebook or Twitter as soon as they wake up. And there's a category of customer who will go on YouTube and watch Hanuman Chalisa. Right? So you have to understand, if you do not categorize, and this is Vivid also said initially, you need to, 
with the help of technology categorize your data and go ahead and have your marketing done there is no harm i'm sure other should agree sending messages no problem we want them to send messages eventually we want businesses to grow but if you send messages without thinking about anything and say i got a million data let me just throw the messages cool you'll get blocked one day you have to read that out of this million people data that you have what kind of behavior they are what kind of background they come from why do they want to talk some of them are incorrect numbers you want to send to aman but it's going to kt is it not the right is it the right way no it is not so you have to have this behavior ashu where you just do not go blindly because you have a purpose or a tool in hand but you have to put the human behavior understand that everybody is a human see businesses are run by humans so businesses understand adarsh being in telecom guys is still saying listen i do not want you to spam people it if messages goes down i'm sure it will hit the it will business but we still agree and that is what business needs to understand we are not serving anybody else but to humans and to understand the human behavior we have to first test a thing that we are doing to others is it good to me or not and if you believe that it probably will work better Okay, so again, since today I'm on a headline giving spree, probably uh, let me try and sum that up. So the animal behavior of companies needs a more sometimes needs a more humane touch. If I may say so. So today I'm on. Go uh, ahead for that. <laughs> okay, Vivek, I'd like uh, you if you could probably give the sum and substance of some of those building blocks. Data is pretty sure it is, but for companies which are embarking on a newer journey. for you know uh, the kind of cx that uh, could help them grow what should be their first few steps if you could uh, uh, share that please okay so as um, as i say i should the first step is the customer once i understand what my customer i have observed him enough and i know what he wants uh, the rest of the building blocks i think where we talk to companies is that it's not about reinventing the wheel right the entire service ecosystem uh, right now in india has become exceptionally strong right number of startups uh, established players are now there who can actually service and help you in terms of speed to market so leverage alliances leverage partnerships and push your speed to market that's mm-hmm. the second the third one is obviously your entire supply chain what is your fulfillment model what is your logistics model do you need to you know again can you leverage third parties and therefore push for this entire omni channel and the last very fundamental building block which i think i've heard all the panelists say please ensure that your organization structure is aligned to what you are doing you yep. cannot have old kpis running for a completely fundamentally new business model you have to align your kpis you have to align your people and you have to align your entire training module to ensure that they are all talking the same language so i think these are the fundament and you know, obviously data analytics and all to support it but these are the three four fundamental building blocks which we suggest that companies embark on you get speed and you build a sustainable model okay that's the big picture of course too many details to work out on and that's where the experience you know the Uh, some of the points that uh, the experts make that is important time now to probably wrap up yes uh, it is aman uh, can you sum it up for us a word of thanks for everyone as well please right thank you so much ashu and first of all the thanks goes to you for conducting this session it's been pleasure having you on board uh, and same goes for panel look at the kind of panel we have we have people from the market we have people from the digital space we have Vivek who talks about data and the behavior and experience that comes from, and Katie and me who talks about the experience we got in terms of implementing these solutions. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. One of few of the points that we guys really got on touch and spoke about is data privacy, behavior of our customers, how technology can really help all of our customers, but provided. it's been used humanely it has a mind of its own and the mind of course unfortunately we are not living in the terminator era that it has its own mind we have to bring that mind so how you read that data is also becomes very crucial and with today's session i think all of our viewers would reach to this conclusion that if you are bidding a retail company or you are going towards retail 
omni-channel behavior, make sure you go through all these points that we have covered. Make sure the bank logo is there so that they <laughs> click the net banking point as well or give them a good wallet as well to click on. So thank you so much for everyone for joining in. Uh, from Katie's point, from our point, we are more than happy. If there are any questions required, you can reach out to us on our LinkedIn pages and we are more than happy to help. Okay, Aman, thanks indeed. Thank you. So content is king is something that we've heard always. What, uh, uh, you know, this 90-minute conversation also indicated context is king. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and being with us on the Economic Times. Signing off for today. Thanks, indeed. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.